I think it is don't be afraid to play with color. Check it out. See what you can do with it. See what others are doing with it. Is that something you can mirror? Is it something you can mock up? Test it out with people that you trust, their opinion of. Um, test it with a wide range of people so that you're getting lots of different perspectives. And I think it is just have fun with it. Uh, I don't think we have enough fun in our jobs sometimes. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are or in, and wherever you're watching from. My name is Matt Pierce, host of The Visual Lounge. And today we are going to be talking with Tracy Parrish and she's gonna help us talk about color. Color, something we probably see and think about every single day, but the application of color is such an important thing when we think about learning, we think about communicating to people. So we're gonna go through some of the questions to help us understand a little bit more about how we can use it. But if you're saying to yourself, Matt, who's Tracy? Let's go ahead and introduce her right now. Tracy Parrish is an education technology specialist for Regional Health Center in the greater Toronto area. She has a diverse educational background of computer programming, adult education, and e-learning design and development, leading to an instructional design career. Tracy has over 15 years of experience in instructional design, development, and project management, as well as LMS implementation and administration. She is an active Articulate community hero, co-host of the Toronto Storyline user group, and the webcast Nerdy Shop Talk, the social media slash marketing director for the Canadian e-learning conference, and a moderator of the weekly Twitter event, Learn Chat, which is spelled L-R-N-C-H-A-T, if you want to look it up. With that said, let's welcome Tracy to the Visual Lounge. Hey, Tracy. Thank you so much, Matt. Hello. <laughs> oh, it's so great to have you here. Always uh, love seeing you at conferences and getting to, to chat with you. So we're glad that you could join us today. It's, it's always fantastic. Excellent. Thank you so much. So let's dive in. We're, we're going to start with our normal kind of questions that not about color. We'll get to those in about five minutes or so. But first question I want to ask you, how did you get involved with starting to use color and design in your work? Because this is something you're presenting on. This is something you talk about fairly regularly. So what was the start for you? Uh, I think, I mean, as soon as you start creating e-learning content or learning content, uh, you start playing with color right away, but you sort of like use all the colors, everything you can think of, you get slapping in there, right? Um, but I think some of the things that really struck me were some sessions that I saw years ago with Connie Malamed, like sort of describing how to best do visual design, and she's got fabulous books on it. But I saw a session that she did um, about really how, how to present your data and how to present your information. And I think that sort of struck a chord with me to think a little more about what I was doing. And I also think some other sessions that I've gone to as well have, have really sort of started formulating in my mind that I need to think more about it. And, and how do I apply it to my work in a way that makes more sense and, and sets what I want the learner to sort of experience. Yeah, I love how that that happens, right? Like we see stuff that says, "Oh, oh, I had no idea. I didn't know that that was a thing, right?" Like in and Connie's work, and she's she's been on uh, an, as a, an episode uh, earlier this year, and you know what a wonderful what a wonderful person to to learn from, right? Yeah, a hundred percent. She just she is a depth of knowledge for so many topics. Yeah, absolutely. I love tapping, and I love to tap into other people that are in the in the industry because so many of us have so many different experiences whether we're working in one in industry or whether we're working freelance and doing a whole bunch of different things we're touching on so many different subjects and all of those things sort of impact everything we're doing and designing absolutely so our next question for you is and, and we'll think more broadly for this one but how do you define success for good design so obviously color is part of that but we're talking it's just kind of that visual design aspect of learning yeah. What what is good? I mean, I know this is like a million dollar question, so big and broad. But what what is good learning? What does good design look like? So, uh, this this might be you know sort of off the cuff here, but I mean, we just rolled out our mandatory annual training that comes out every single year. And for me, successful design are the ones where I'm not getting all the complaints back about something's <laughs> not working. <laughs> so this year, so far, fingers crossed, I've got a third of my staff have gone through the training without things breaking, without things stopping, without things, you know, messing up. So I think that's a big success that, you know, you're not getting feedback back that something's not working, something's not right. Uh, that's a huge one right there. 
<laughs> that that is huge, and uh, that's congratulations. That's uh, amazing. Hopefully, you'll get another third to go through without. With there we the go. <laughs> same same uh, kind of success rate. Okay, last question before we move on uh, to our, our really our deeper conversation about color. If you get to give one tip, what's one tip you could give our audience about improving whether it's images or video use in their work? So how how can they maybe make better images or videos? For me, I think you have to really think outside of what you typically would create. So uh, for me, sometimes I'm looking at, I, you said one tip, but <laughs> um, when I'm looking for images, if I want to use them, I find pieces that I can use multiple different ways. I think that's the biggest tip I can find is find something that you can either take that character out of it, or you can crop it and just use a piece of it, or there's colors within it you want to use in a color scheme. That's where I hone in on looking at images and colors and, and assets that I'm using. Well, I, I love that. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question to that? Because mm -hmm. I, I think in theory, that's like, oh, yeah. But to me, I think that feels a little, it's, sometimes it's difficult. So do you have advice on how to, like, what to look for that allows you to do that maybe better? Anything you've picked up over the years of experience? Uh, I think, yeah, that might, be, that might be more challenging because I am in an industry where I've, I've been in the same place for a long time. So I sort of know the types of courses that are coming mm. to me for design. So I know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the office space that doesn't look too much like an office space because we haven't got a lot of those in my, my area. Um, I'm looking for characters that show a wide range of nationalities, ethnicities. Um, I'm looking for pictures that don't have too much in the background, that they're not too busy. Uh, so yeah, I think it might be relative to your area that you're working in, but I do think you can sort of start thinking about what those things might be that would help you to use them over and over. Well, I, I love that. And I, I, you know, I hadn't thought about like, uh, obviously there's a, a trend for using lots of different types of characters, right? And obviously showing diversity and nationalities, gender, things like that are, are, are yeah. key. Um, but finding ones that have like the same person, maybe in multiple poses or thinking about like, you know, not just finding whatever person stock photo, right? That's got like generic people, but you never see the people again in any other imagery. Well, that's what, yeah, you saying that is interesting because one of the things, because um, I am in healthcare, so one of the things I've noticed is that if you are using stock images or you're using Pexels or, or Unsplash or something like that, there are set characters that keep coming up. Mm -hmm. So you'll see the same office guy, like there's this one real hipster guy and he's got this great beard and the suit and one time he's drinking coffee on a bench and next time he is the doctor that is prescribing this and the next time he's the patient that is sad so it's like yeah can you find a character that hasn't been overused and or can you find a character that has enough poses for what you need that's challenging too yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm just thinking here, like, and I was like, oh, wait a second. Hey, can he be the person that's the drinking coffee, the doctor and the patient? And yes, people, do yeah. doctors are patients. Doctors are, you know, so yeah. I, so I, I love that example. And what a what great advice, right? Reuse the things, find things that you can use in multiple ways and not, uh, you know, get trapped by like, oh gosh, we did this, but now we can't do it anywhere yeah. else. So yeah. Well, Tracy, let's let's move into our our, our conversation about color because I think color is obviously something that gets used in design a lot, has a lot of purpose. So, let's start broad and we'll kind of get more and more focused. So, f from a kind of design perspective, what's the purpose of having color in your design? Why? I mean, obviously, there's good reasons to have color, but what what are some of those reasons that you think of? So, some of the reasons you might want to use it is for that for contrast to make something stand out beyond everything else that's on the page or on the screen, uh, that you wanna draw the focus of your learner to that piece. It might be to that button, it might be to that text. Um, and then the other reason you might use color is to set, set that tone or set that mood uh, that you're trying to create within the learning environment that you're creating. Those would so, be the sort of the two of them. So let me ask you this then. So, uh, you know, I, from a design perspective, I love the contrast, right? You're using it to stand, have things stand out, but I think there's a, a gut reaction that I have sometimes and I have to kind of control maybe a little bit is like, I want to beautify. I want to make things more, look better. Uh, mm -hmm. sh should in a design perspective, particularly we'll focus on learning here is, is 
color? Should I use it in that way or should I be careful about, really careful about using it for kind of just decorative reasons? You can use it for decorative for sure, um, but you want to use it, you don't want to use it too much, right? Because you don't want to draw too much attention away from the learner just remembering all the pretty things that you put in the course. You want to make sure that they're focusing on the content and the pretty things in the background are um, adding to it, not drawing away from it, right? I think that would be more so what we would try to, I think most people would try to say that's what we want. We want the person to remember the Wemyss symbol, not that the Wemyss symbol was in a beautiful plaid color that you, you slapped on top of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So as, as you're considering and you're designing things, you know, it seems like color uh, has el different elements, kind of different functions. What, what are some of the elements of color do we need to be thinking about? Like broadly thinking, when I start to say, oh, I want to use, I want to add some color, whether it's for emphasis or whether it's for enhancing, or maybe it's even just decorative. What, what should I keep in mind as I start picking and adding color to my designs? So there's a couple of things there is you'll have, um, I mean, you'll have the people that are stuck with branding. So they are stuck with a blue and they have to use that corporate blue. So things you can do there is that there are websites um, and not that I'm tied to any of them, but if you start looking at the websites that have uh, presentation templates on them, something like Creative Market, if I can name drop here, Creative yeah, yeah, Market, yeah. I'm not, not associate with any of them. It's just some of the ones I go to. Uh, it has thousands of templates on it. So you can go into there and take some ideas about how do they use one color for branding? And sometimes that's putting an overlay over top of a picture so that it's a black and white photo that they've put the blue branding mm. on. Or sometimes it's a color photo with just that little blue as a frame on it. So sometimes when you're stuck with a color, there's lots of things you can still do that's creative. The other thing you can do is try a few things out. Can you go and use a blend of that blue from a darker to lighter tone? show it to the people that have to give you the okay. And they might actually go, hey, you've got something that's working here and yes, you can go two or three shades darker or brighter. Um, uh, sorry, can you rephrase the question again there or retell me it? Yeah, no. I went, a, I went on a tangent there about being stuck with one color and I'm like, what no, else that's, were I? That's great <laughs> because I, I love that, right? Like, and I, I was even thinking like, I love the idea of using the, the color over a gradient kind of as a, over a black and white photo to give it a different color. But it's, it's really about like, you know, what other things should we consider? Obviously if we have branding, we got to stick to branding, but are there other Sorry, things we yeah. should be aware of with color? Cause I'll be really honest. Uh, I feel like whatever day we talked about color in primary school, I missed <laughs> like, you know, I think I was in, I was thinking about it before our conversation today. I was like, when did I figure out that there's like certain color, primary colors, secondary colors? I'm like, I was kind of old. Like it wasn't like, you know, most kids learn it like kindergarten. I, yeah. I missed that day. So I'm, I'm like, okay, what else do I need to know about color in terms of effective kind of use? Any other pieces or elements to be aware of? So other things are like, there are color theory that will, I think we're going to talk about that maybe a little bit more in, in depth after, but um, there are colors that work well together and colors that do not work well together. And you I would imagine most of us, when you put two colors that don't work well together, your eyes just sort of hurt looking mm -hmm. at them. So you probably already are doing some color. I mean, you've got some great color blending in the background of your screen right now. Um, and those tones work well together. But a lot of these tools that let you pick color, Adobe's got color picker. If you just look up color scheme, color picker, color themes, they will come up and there's different, different ways that the colors, if you have a blue, then the colors that go right side by side on it on a color wheel. If you look up a color wheel, you I think a lot of us are used to that rainbow kind of mm -hmm. piece. Um, colors that are side by side work well together. Colors that are in sort of a shape of a square on that wheel work well together. So there's all sorts of ways to find those and use those together. There's lots of tools out there that will give you color themes and color um uh, um, yeah, color schemes that you can use. But what I would say is when you look at those, some of those color schemes that look great side by side, when you actually put on the screen and try to use as a button or as text, you start looking at them going, oh, I can't read that. Like it doesn't mm -hmm. actually work on the screen. So sometimes it's a playing back and forth. 
Uh, some other things you can do too is you can create a template if you're using any particular tool. Uh, if you are using something like Storyline, you can make um, one slide that has text on it, one that has buttons, and it has arrows, and it has all sorts of shapes on it. And as you put colors in, you can see what they look like based on those elements on the screen. It gives you a way to sort of test them out with one another. And the other thing, another one more thing you can do is create one or two test slides and give them to a group. Give them to a focus group. A couple of people, your friends, your colleagues, go, what do you think of this? Is this conveying the mood that I want it to do? Um, that I'm trying to set with this course because I have had that come up where I put the wrong colors on a course and the mood was just it was off I I found a template that I really liked thought it was great it was all business tones very darks um, dark red dark black dark gray mm -hmm. and the course was supposed to be happy and uplifting like it was supposed to be about how do we how do we improve experience how do we make this happier how do we make this better for people and i took the course and i'm like oh, why am i so depressed and i realized <laughs> it's the colors right if i flipped it to blue and white and it just changed the whole mood of it so i think that helps too is we get bogged down in our own design and we forget to ask other people sort of what do you think i yeah. think that helps too. I, I love that, especially you've you've given me a flashback to uh, in grad school, we had to do like websites and we had to build all these kind of multimedia stuff for instructional purposes. And I remember we had to do a website and I, you know, present, then you would get up in front of a class and present it, right? Like, and say like, here's what my, I'm worth thinking about. And I remember the very specific moment I got this comment about the color scheme I had chosen. And, you know, I didn't know anything about color, especially then. And I definitely didn't really think hard about it. And, but it was that exact same thing is like, Ooh, they're like, this doesn't really fit with your topic. Why are you using that color, those colors versus like something? And it was like a, a educational children's television website about the history of educational children's television. And it was not meshing. So it's like, oh. Yeah, so. I mean, it's, I think the other thing, I don't know that a lot of us e-learning designers go along the, the path of creating a mood board. Mm. Um, and I think that's something maybe we can get from the uh, interior design sort of field is that they create a mood board. They find images about the topic that they're talking about from magazines and websites and slap them together and then draw colors from that to sort of convey the message that you want to convey the message or mood that you're trying to convey. Yeah. I, I see the same thing with our UX uh, designers and researchers, right? Like they're, they're putting together boards that help them to see how things fit together. So I, so I, so I love this. So ultimately though, Tracy, I feel like um, color still feels like all these great tips you've just given us, it feels still very subjective. Like I might look at something and say like, oh, that looks really great. You might look at it and say like, oh, it feels off considering the, uh, maybe the topic or whatever. But how do we, how do we know if we're using colors in a way that is correct? Is it just kind of that, well, if the majority of the people think it's good, you're good or, or what do we do? Well, I don't know. That's a good question. I would, I am thinking it is a bit subjective, right? I know there are, there is theory, there is color theory and you, it's, I mean, that's a whole day's topic, but there are tools that will help you pick colors that work well together. So at least you can start with picking colors that work well together. Uh, should purple be used when you're talking about oranges in Florida? Maybe not. Maybe you need oranges and greens <laughs> and yellows and those kind of colors. Um, you probably need colors that match the subject that you're talking about, but you could pick a blue, a purple, and a pink, and they're going to mesh well together, but subjectively somebody's going to go, I don't think those go with the color, the topic. So I think there's two different things there. Like it, you can always pick colors that will work well, but do they work well with the topic? And I think those are two sort of different things. No, that's, that's great. So let's talk about, um, enhancing your work. Cause you mentioned like emphasizing stuff. So what are some ways we can use color to actually enhance like learning or understanding? What, what would you suggest people try doing? Or obviously there's lots of different ways to approach it, but what would you recommend? So I think a lot of people sort of know not to use too many fonts in, right. in a course, right? It's like, we want to say all the, you know, use all the fonts. No, use one, two, maybe three fonts at most, or one font in multiple sizes. Do the same thing with your color. Pick one to three colors, maybe four at maximum, but pick those colors and use one for your heading. Use one to just pop out um, those uh, buttons that are the click next buttons kind of things or click here to go on or your uh, 
interaction kind of buttons. So use them sparingly. One will be your main and one will be the thing that's always the action kind of thing. Try to do it a little bit more sparingly. Sparingly, That would be one way. Another way is to use multiple colors. If you have a topic, I've had a few topics that there's um, there, there was one subject, it had eight different sections to it. Well, every section had its own color. Mm -hmm. So I picked a scheme of colors that worked well together, but then the user knows that all of the ones that have this pink background are all going to be of that topic. The next one that's blue is all going to be the next topic. So you can use it that way to make the content um, uh, stick with one, like stick with the same, same subject, help them to see it that way too. And the other thing that I don't do nearly enough, that, but I see lots of examples of in the different forums and communities, is um, using color just as the background. I get so stuck on the, let's make it quick, let's make it fast, so I always have the white background. And I forget that I can convey a mood by maybe using a yellow background, using something else instead of white space, quote unquote. It can be anything in the background. Uh, and I, I do think I don't do that well enough or enough. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm curious because I, I think I'm very much a kind of a white background, black background, nothing really much in between. In, in, since you're saying you should do it more, what's an example of a time you might want to have a more of a colorful background versus, and I say colorful meaning it could be any shade or tone, but uh, yeah. versus white or just kind of black? Um, I think if you, like I've seen some really good ones where, uh, I've seen ones that are sort of more muted topics. Um, it, where they might have a gray background just to sort of bring down the mood of the course. I've seen other ones that were uplifting about pets and it was all bright and yellow. Uh, so it, again, it, it sort of depends on, I think it, a lot of it depends on the topic that you're working with. Uh, but can you, a way to look at that is to take a look at websites that are doing it and doing it well, because a lot of websites uh, if you look at some of them, uh, another website that I go to a lot for inspiration is Awards, and Awards mm -hmm. has three W's in it, but they give a, they give uh, awards for the best website of the month, of the week, of the year kind of thing, and you can break it down into, do you want to just see interactions, do you want to just see backgrounds, do you just want to see who's using best images? And I think some of those looking out into the media that's around us sometimes helps. What's the billboard that you're looking at? When you're at the theater, how are some of the commercials being presented on the screens? I mean, cars do it well when they're selling different cars. Their backgrounds are not usually white. They're usually something splashy and fat, and it's splashy in the background. And I think it helps draw our attention into the topic that we're looking at. Well, well, I love this idea that you're you're going to these places for this inspiration, right? Because it feels like whereas. I, I, I'm assuming you don't consider yourself a color expert and neither am I, uh, but it's, but I think this is what, uh, what people who do a lot of art or a lot of things, they go and look at color. They go look at examples. What, what did somebody else do? Um, a uh, little bit aside here, but I, you know, I was just on a vacation and we went to a number of uh, museums, saw a number of famous art pieces of artwork. And one of the things that really struck me is how many people were, they were literally just kind of like saying, oh, look what they did. I can do it better. But they were definitely drawing and learning from each other, like what colors and shades. And I think that's probably great advice for us is like, what is someone that you admire that you like doing and can you borrow not copy, but borrow their ideas of color and theory of how it blends and what they're doing. It seems to make really good sense. So I appreciate that, that advice to go and to do that. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, even sometimes just the products you see on the shelf, the way the chip bag looks like I saw something just in one of the local coffee shops and they've got their different healthy snacks on the counter, but I'm like, Oh, that's neat. Like the apple ones are red and the green, you know, the next mm. one is green. And they're not just sort of the standard colors. I would think of when I think of red and green, they're these bright, vibrant sort of colors. And I think we sort of have to look at the environment that we're around a lot and mimic what's going on in the current environment um, into our materials too. It sort of helps the user feel that we're current with what they're looking at. And I sometimes will do that with courses. I just go back and we'll refresh them with a new scheme, a new color scheme makes them feel completely new sometimes. 
I love that. That's a great way to make people think, well, I haven't, cause I, I get that fatigue, right? I've done this. I've done this course like three times, but yeah. the new color scheme, ah, oh, so fancy <laughs> using our, using our noodle with probably, probably not that much work, right? Make it exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. Um, so I'm going to ask this. I know we've talked about this, but let's, I want to just hone a little bit more. So you talked about a couple sites that you could use to select colors that work together well. So and I know there's a number of them out there. I've, I've used them before, but is there something when I go to one of those I should be looking for? Is it just kind of carte blanche, take whatever they give me and say like, yep, that's those. I like this color and these are the associated ones. Or are there things I should be considering as I am selecting these these colors from these color picker sites that give me, you know, I think some of them give me like six different color options. Like I'm, I'm I get overwhelmed very easily with the colors. Yes, um, I do too. There's so many to choose from. So I find it's a lot of, for me, it's a lot of testing. So one of the things I am um, I'm much more aware of now is uh, trying to find colors that are accessible. Because most often the colors I'm picking, um, although I say a lot about, you know, let's, let's put uh, borders and flashy things around our images and stuff. I, I actually don't do that as often as I probably should. So I'm usually picking, picking colors for my fonts and things and, or my buttons. And, um, I'm now realizing that I go back and look at courses and think I found the right shade of blue. And then I use an accessibility checker and go, you know what, that blue is just not, it's not great. So there are lots of tools out there too, that you can just, you know, Google and search for again that are accessibility color colors accessibility color palettes um, and there's some of those that are now my go-to's because there are so many out there that you can use um, but again even those sometimes i will pick the color looks great on the screen and then i put it into my slide and it's it doesn't work mm. it just it, for some reason it still doesn't pop out as much as i want it to do or that little that little square that you get on your screen that goes, oh, this is a great purple. When you actually put it down to just a font, it sort of gets washed out or it's way too dark or sort of not exactly what you're looking for. I, I think it is a lot of trial and error sometimes. Which which is a, a perfectly acceptable answer. I think there's yeah. no, sometimes in life that's how the way it is. You just got to try, try it out. And I, so, I, so I do appreciate that, that I need mm -hmm. to be more, maybe I need to be a little bit more diligent in really testing. But you, since you brought up accessibility, let's, I want to talk about that for a second because I do feel like this is one area that uh, it's an, it, hopefully an easy win for people to get better design, right? Whether mm -hmm. you're doing websites or e-learning or whatever you're doing. So, but maybe, and, and I know you're not necessarily an accessibility expert, but you do, you do, I know you work really hard to try to make your stuff accessible. Um, so with color, what is the reason for the trying to be accessible? What are we kind of taking into consideration here for, for those who maybe are colorblind or maybe there's other issues with accessibility? Help us know. So, yeah, I am by, by no means an expert. I'm just learning from others and trying to get better at it. Um, I saw one example. I saw, I believe the name is Robin Smale. And I think she was, I don't know if she's still with Penn State, but she was, was working with Penn State. And she did a really great presentation on them creating a badging system for their courses and their work. And that one really struck home for me because they were trying to make this beautiful, beautiful badging system. And every badge had all these fancy colors and things. But then when she showed what it looked like to somebody who might be colorblind or have some sort of other, um, color impairment that they can't see the millions of colors that somebody else can see uh you could really see that it was really hard to tell one from the other uh so that if you don't have all the words clear enough or the icons clear enough if you're just relying on the red and the blue side by side or the red and the orange or green whatever if you're relying on them to choose things based on that they might not be able to mm. and so that was really interesting to see that. So they then went to a bunch of colors that were accessible friendly, but then to somebody who can see lots of colors, they were a bunch of muted tones. So then the final way they did it was they used very bright colors as the border and the very pale color as the background and then black text on top. 
So it was a very, it was a good balance between what somebody with lots of color sight can see and somebody with minimal color sight can see that they were still accessible for one another. And I've gone back through so many of my courses, my presentations that I even did a year ago and went, what was I thinking? Why did I put that gray font on that white background? You can't see it. Um, so I, I, I've put into my daily practice uh, I have a little accessibility contrast checker on my Chrome browser that I just click on it and can drop and find, is this color something that somebody can read? How big should the font be so, to make sure that they can see it? Is it okay for me to use white on this color or should I be using black text on this color? Uh, it's just those little things that, I mean, it's not so much the images you're thinking about, it's the pieces that they're interacting with, the words that they're reading, the buttons that they're clicking. And there's different tools too that you can put something, a screenshot up and go, can you tell that this button is the click next button and this button is the cancel button? Like it's very important that the person knows which button's going to do which thing. Yeah, I, I, I love this because here we just had this conversation about ascribing some like value to color like for making things you know, I, I, the button example is a really good one, right? You want your button to stand out. You want it to be seen as something that you would want it to interact with. But yet, if it's not, if someone's, whether they're having, they're colorblind or there's some other issues that they might be having, uh, it, you know, it might change that experience completely. And, and that's, you know, you don't know who that might affect. Uh, so, I, so I love that you're thinking about this and I love that you're you're checking it. And I, so I, so you mentioned a tool to do that. Like, so if I want to be better at this, uh, obviously it's, it's trial and error, right? I need to test it. Um, but maybe what's the tool that I could use if I got a free one that you could drop or any yeah, other considerations? So the, the one I'm using right now is, uh, <laughs> no, I think it's Stark, Stark mm -hmm. Accessibility Checker. It's part of the whole Figma suite, but it's, a, um, it's an extension you can add on to Chrome. And there's a, there's a paid version, but the free version is just this quick little uh, eyedropper that can pick any color on the screen, two different colors. So I can pick this text on this background and it's a real quick thing to see. Uh, it will tell you whether it's um, double A compliant or triple A compliant in the accessibility sort of checking. And there's lots of them that you can find that you can just pop open and keep on your screen. That one's been very consistently working well for me. Uh, it also has another a little uh, piece on it too that you can check the contrast. So if you have, if you have the typical color blindness that we most of us that don't have it know about, that's red and red and green. Uh, but there's like five or six other ones that are there as well that you can check to see whether your images are going to stand out the way you intend them to stand out. Yeah. So I want to I want to reemphasize something that I, I I'm just making these connections right. So. I, get to play the role of the like oh my gosh okay so because it's not just color it's not just the yep. like is it red is it green is it blue is it whatever it's the contrast that does it stand out against whatever it is and this is where color gets tricky if you're using an uh, maybe a complex image and you're putting like blue text or red text over something and it's like well does that red text gonna stand out on this Im on top of this image of this person who's got you know it's already bit, maybe it's got lots of colors or whatever. So, so yeah, yeah. I love this. It's not real colors. One element, right? It's the, there's lots of things that come along with, you know, contrast, making it stand out. I'm sure I'm not thinking of all the words for the yeah. terms around well, colors, but yeah. Yeah. Well, there's, there's two other things I would, I would share too. There's, um, there's a really good article by stripe.com. Uh, they have one from probably four years back, but you could find stripe.com's accessibility document and they went through their website to find out the colors that they were using and if they were accessible and then what they went through to find colors that were accessible and they're almost identical like if you if you look at them you're kind of going I don't quite see the difference but there is a distinct difference especially when you get down to the yellow or orange you can really see the difference um, but they were using them so they found out well which ones can we use for fonts and which ones can we use for icons and then what color will work best with them too. And it's a really good article. It gets a little technical, uh, but that's a really good one. And there's another article somewhere too. And I, I think it was on medium.com, but I can't remember who re wrote it, but it has to do about um, an orange button, white text on an orange button, because I made a button like that. And I went, is this, is this okay? Can I use white text on an orange button? 
And then it went through this article, and this gentleman did a, a, a bunch of tests with people. He just went to his colleagues and said, what do you think? What do you think? And that particular one, white on orange, is actually more accessible than orange, black on orange. And yeah. But it's a little subjective, too, because if you start asking people, uh, they will tell you, based on a lot of people that have astigmatism, will say the black on orange didn't hurt their eyes quite as much as the white on orange. Mm. Like, there's something with there that makes the colors vibrate to one another. And you're like, that's, I don't like the way that looks. Um, <laughs> but that's where it gets interesting in asking other people around you, a little focus group, a little collective people that you can tap into going, what do you think? And especially if you know what if you can find somebody that has color blindness or you have somebody that has, they always work in a dark room or they always work at nighttime compared to somebody who always works in the daytime. Uh, I do have some designers that I know colleagues that I work with that they will create their courses so that they can have a dark scheme and a light scheme, depending on the person that's taking the course and what time of day they're taking it. Uh, we're starting to think more about this and it's more about not, it's not, it's making the, like you said the words before, making the experience the same for everybody, right? That uni universal design, if we can do it. I mean, I'm not doing it yet. I'm trying. I'm trying to get there. I think most of us are trying to get there. Some of us are doing it amazing. And I think more of us are just trying to get there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I, 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 yeah, I love that you're thinking about it. I love that if you're listening to the podcast, you should be thinking about it, right? Like, how do we get a little bit better? And I, I heard a great talk from Diane Elkins that, you know, the idea is not necessarily to let, we don't have to go from zero to a hundred today, but let's start moving towards a hundred. So we're making this experience better and, you know, we're progressing towards that because the shift is hard. It's hard to get mm -hmm. to a hundred, but if we can do five, 10, 20, 50, you know, that's going to be a better experience. I've got, I've got two other questions before we go to our speed round. Um, one of them will be, will be fairly quick, but I, I, real quick, we've talked about accessibility from a kind of an impairment or, uh, you know, a, accessibility as tr kind of true nature. But are, are there considerations from cultural perspectives that we should be aware of with color? I, you know, I've heard things over the years. I don't I don't know exactly what is or what isn't true anymore. But uh, any thoughts on cultural considerations for color? Uh, again, not an expert, but. I've been, I, I was privileged at, and I will say this, I was privileged at DevLearn that I did a present, I did a workshop on visual design and I was describing colors and what they, what they do mean to sort of like, what does the color sort of mean to a Western environment versus uh, other environments? And I don't, I don't know all the answers for other cultures. Um, but when I was describing some of the cultures, even just from a Western perspective, I used words that probably weren't the best way to describe them. And I was so thankful. Somebody called me out on it in the class, came up to me afterwards and goes, can I give you some feedback about that? And, um, and yeah, I just, sometimes we say things we don't actually mean, mm -hmm. uh, or we're, we're, we're just pulling the words that have been sort of stuck in our brains for years. And we go, okay, wait, that's not really what I meant about that color. That's not the reason I use that color. Um, so we do have to have some of that consideration. Again, it's going to come down to your audience who you're delivering it to. Uh, but you do want to be mindful. If you're using red, uh, red can sometimes be a joyful color and sometimes it can be a dangerous color. So sort of what is the context you're using it in and does that make sense for your audience that's looking at it? Uh, there's a green color that I think uh, it is something... It's not Fiji, but it's something like that. There's a green color that is a very dangerous color where we think of it as Western culture is fresh. Um, the, the spring brings green grass, brings green trees. So we sort of think of a re rejuvenation a lot of the times when we think of green in a Western culture. In this other culture, it's a dangerous color because it's the same color as the water that has a great undercurrent that could drag you back out to sea. Mm. So there's sort of this, it's sort of thinking like, but would I know that? No, I just happened to come across that fact. Um, so I think, yeah, we can think about those things. And again, I guess it comes down to knowing your audience, knowing your topic. Um, I, I haven't heard a lot of people get offended by the colors that you're using or the colors that you're choosing. Uh, but I think the way that we use them or the way we represent them, uh, we need to be mindful of. 
Yeah, for sure. And I love that, right? It goes back to what you said earlier about testing, asking people like, hey, does this make sense? Does this fit with, with our thoughts? Okay, mm -hmm. I want to get to this last question before we speed round. Pantone color of the year, what is it? And why Why should we care about it? Because I actually know what the color is, but uh, and I know you you're, do too. You're trying to quiz me? <laughs> Viva Magenta! <laughs> and I'm like, so... I love it. If you look up the Pantone color of the year, like the way they describe it every year is just phenomenal. I just love that. But Viva Magenta is the color this year. It's sort of a raspberry sort of tone, raspberry purpley sort of tone, uh, more on the darker side. And why we should care about it is because it gets set. Like Pantone is sort of like the color people and designers, interior designers look at it. Uh, UX designers, UI designers, people that are making marketing look at these tones and they start coming into everything we do. And you might not know it yet, but the blue, like the, the, you'll see it in clothing, you'll see it in fabric choices, you'll see it in, it even comes into planting and in gardens. So suddenly the gardens will all have that tone in them. Last year it was more of this purpley color. It was, um, what was it last year? Uh, it was a flower color and I can't think of it now, but it was a purpley tone, sort of the one over your shoulder. And that was in the garden. So this year it's going to be more of these magenta tones and it comes everywhere. So do we have to use it in what we're using? No, but will it tie your user to what's going on in their environment around them when they go out on the street and look at their phone cases? Yes. And I mean, I even looked this morning because when I, I saw you're going to ask me that color, I'm like, I know it's magenta, but what was the name before it? So <laughs> like even, even, uh, another name drop, even Bob Vila's website has up ways to use magenta this year. And there's pillows and there's wall paintings and there's, uh, you know, earring and fashion accessories, running shoes. Like it will be everywhere. So that's why, yeah, pay attention to the color of the year. It's fun to use. It's fun to change things up each year. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I think it's, it's also, it's just uh, another way to be in tune with the what's happening in the design world with color, right? Like not that yeah. we, you know, we probably have brand colors that we have to use. Uh, <laughs> Viva Magenta is not in my brand wheel, uh, yeah. but, but just understanding it and being thinking about it. And I didn't quite nail it on the pink side, but you know, it's, it's uh, almost there. It's <laughs> almost there. It's really hard to do with light. Uh, but, but your shirt was the color like two years ago. So, Hey, <laughs> so, so yeah. And snag has been blue for years. This is, although the shade has changed slightly over, over time. So we, we nailed it at least we're a little bit, maybe uh, one year. We'll get it one year. You'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Tracy, this has been uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you for uh, all the great information and dropping these resources. But right now we're going to go into our speed round questions. So here we go. Okay, so what we do is speed round. These are quick, meant to be quick, fast answers. Uh, and we'll, we're going to roll die to determine okay. which questions we're going to ask. I've got three dice. I'm, I'm going to let you, I like to let you choose. I, I need to get more of these dice, 12-sided dice, need more colors. But I've got blue and gold, a black with white, or a kind of a marbly greenish whatever with white. Any, any color preference? Let's go with the blue one. The blue with the gold, okay. Blue, so, blue with gold, yeah. Here, here, here we go. So here's our, our, we got our dice tray. I'm going to put my hand up just because it likes to roll out. Okay. We're going to uh, ask question number 12. So what's your one go-to tool that helps you get your job done on a regular basis? Now this doesn't have to be about color, but what's one tool that you're just like, like I live and die by that. It could be software. It could be physical gear. It could be whatever. Is it bad to say Chrome? Like if no. I, I, I use Chrome every single day and I probably have, I mean, people laugh at me. I often will have 25 tabs open on multiple windows. Like I just <laughs> am always collecting things and opening up. Okay. So I'll, uh, you know, I think a lot of us use Chrome. Um, the other one I'll go with, I'll just say, you said one tool I'm going to do two. Evernote. I use Evernote to capture all of my notes. It captures my thoughts, my, my to-do list, the things I have to pick up from my mother after work. Like it's, I, I think I open, it has all my pro patterns in it. Yeah. I think Evernote is the one tool I open up every other day besides Chrome. <laughs> Perfect. I, I, great, great answers. So let's uh, let's go on with our next question here. We've got second die roll. Question number eight. Eight has been, I think, one. Uh, this. Oh gosh, this will be super fun. Uh -oh. 
<laughs> if you had to pick an image that represented you, what would it be? Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> the first thing, okay, people that know me well, the first thing that comes in my mind is a panda bear like falling off <laughs> one of those balls that they're like trying to play on in the snow. That would be me. <laughs> Perfect. I, no, you know, I never said explain it. I just said pick one. So that's a that's a, a great re visual representation. Well, let's yeah. do one more question here. So last die roll. Here we go. Question number two. Okay. And you talked a little bit about this and I know you, you don't consider yourself a master of the topic. So take it with a grain of salt here. But how did you master in quotes, get better at learn the topic we talked about today. I mean, we, I know you talked about learning from Connie going to kind of learning from other people, but is there any other resources maybe you've dug into that you haven't mentioned? Yeah. I mean, I've gone on to all sorts of different resources, too many to list to just sort of read about it. Um, I keep up on industry standards. I keep up on following UI development, what's going on in that world. I, I just tap into articles about it. I tap into presentations I see about it. I go to webinars that I see about it. So it's just been a long journey of continually reading up on it, continually, continually experimenting and seeing what others are doing. So it's not just one resources resource, it's as many as I can find that I can tap into. I, I love that idea. Always continue to learn, always keep looking because, and especially in the world of color and it's always, things are changing, right? We're learning, we're getting better. Experts are getting better. They're understanding more. So really great answer. Before we go into our final take, Tracy, uh, if people wanted to reach out to you, if they wanted to connect with you, because I know you, you do a lot of great presentations. You have a lot of great uh, resources that you share with people about free tools and using, you know, tools for learning design for, for color and imagery design. Where, where could they find you? Uh, they definitely can find me on LinkedIn. I am there. They can find me on Twitter for as long as Twitter's still around. <laughs> um, you can also reach me. My website is a little under under construction, but you can get me there also, tracyparish.ca. So you, you can find me in any of those spots. It's more than happy. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And so, Tracy, the way we like to wrap up every show is with the final take, that quick summary of things that we've talked about today. So, Tracy, what is your final take? I think it is, don't be afraid to play with color. Check it out, see what you can do with it, see what others are doing with it. Is that something you can mirror? Is it something you can mock up? Test it out with people that you trust, their opinion of. Um, test it with a wide range of people so that you're getting lots of different perspectives. And I think it is just have fun with it. Uh, I don't think we have enough fun in our jobs sometimes. Perfect. Well, Tracy, thank you so much for joining me here on the Visual Lounge. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. You bet. All right, everybody, go check out Tracy's website. Go learn about color. Use color. Have some fun in your life, like Tracy just said. And we want to thank you all for tuning in. You know, we're all about improvement here on the Visual Lounge, getting better, a little bit better every single day. So whatever you're doing, wherever you are, we hope you take a little time to improve every single day. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.